Well, thank you so much for joining us for our third session today of our development day. It's been a wonderful day of learning and professional development. And I thank our members, our corporate clients, and of course our guests today for joining us to hear uh, from three fantastic facilitators. And we've got uh, a fantastic session ahead of us. I'm a little bit worried about um, what I've been told uh, is involved in it, but uh, I know Shannon always brings to the table something a little bit different and um, for these development days, and, and I really can't wait. Um, as you all know, our, our, our training, our learning, our professional development is always about, it's action oriented. It's always about implementing the learning. So I know Shannon's going to go through a number of things today. Make sure you've got your action plans with you, um, ready to go so you can take away some of this learning and implement it straight away. And I know uh, it's going to be a bit of fun um, and we're going to be able to implement some of those things straight away, I hope, into the workplace. Um, so just to get um, some of the uh, discussion out of the way, any questions throughout the session, um, you know, please put that into the chat box. Um, any needs you've got from us, please put that into the chat box for GoToWebinar. This session's recorded um, and uh, all the resources will be available and the recording will be available and sent to you after today's um, session. Um, as you know, the Institute of Managers and Leaders has been here for over 80 years, supporting Australia and New Zealand's largest uh, membership community. Um, we support managers and leaders in every aspect um, of their daily roles and both in personal and professional lives. And obviously sessions like today are built around our professional development framework. Um, and we all know that adaptability has been a critical skill for people um, and for organisations, particularly over the last couple of years. Um, if we've learned anything over the last couple of years, it's that leaders, teams and organisations must be flexible, adaptable and nimble as they solve a number of these new challenges and things like pandemics and um, all sorts of um, craziness going on out there to really try and embrace the opportunities that exist in the marketplace. Um, improvisation, which Shannon's going to talk about today, um, seems to be a bit of a new norm, but improvisation doesn't mean making it up as you go along or winging it. Um, it's about harnessing the power of spontaneity creativity and flexibility to adapt and embrace change. So um, I'm delighted to welcome um, Shannon for this third session, which is titled Setting the Stage for Adaptability Through Improv. Um, and a little bit about Shannon, I'm sure uh, many of you know Shannon and have seen Shannon. Um, uh, I know he's just run from delivering out one of our leadership programs. Um, so he's, um, he's ready to go. I hope you've had a couple of coffees, Shannon, and ready to go. Um, Shannon has a real knack for seeing how people could be, but also the skills and disciplined approach to actually help them realise their potential. His refreshing, energetic and interactive approach, as we all know, has been known to empower employees. It's been known to empower IML members and thrill our customers and clients as well and embolden organisations. Uh, his bespoke training solutions and people-centred philosophy mean clients receive handcrafted solutions based on sharp observations, um, honest conversations and fresh thinking. Shannon has worked with big and small teams alike, single and multi-site businesses, helping lead big impact leadership programs. His high energy workshops and presentations delight audiences while invigorating, while his invigorating training methods also help unsha unshackle powerful ideas and foster lasting organisational change. He has achieved success from the boardroom to the, to the shop floor and from the head office to the site shed. Please welcome Shannon Cooper. Oh, thank you, Sam. Thank you. I always get nervous when uh, like now high expectations, all right? But thank you, Sam, and thank you for everyone else who's joined us. And a good afternoon uh, or good morning uh, if you're perhaps we've got some of our members over there in Perth, or uh, uh, you know, good morning again if you're over there in New Zealand. But wherever you're from today, uh, welcome. And I want to say thank you for coming and joining us for this session as we talk about how do you use improv as as leaders and i can see that we've got uh goodness me close to um almost 150 of our members on board uh for this session and we're going to have a lot of fun over the next hour so if it is lunchtime or breakfast time or morning tea time wherever you are hopefully you've got a coffee and a croissant or a sandwich uh and you you buckle up because we're going to have a lot of fun over the next little while 
So what are we going to do specifically? And what can you expect over the next uh, the next hour? So let me uh, share with you my, my objectives for our time together today. We're going to have a conversation a little bit about what improv is. And maybe some of you think you know what improv is, or you might have a bit of a skewed view about what improv is. But I want to share with you and, and help you understand how we can use the practices of, of, of improvisation in our daily work. Right, and this means what I'm talking about here is how do we how do we be adaptable and flexible in the moment, almost like acting without a script, but that does not mean being unprepared for the challenges that are coming our way. So we're going to talk a little bit about this intersection and how improv can help us. I want to share with you six key principles that um, that uh, they're important in an improv world and how we can apply them in our world as managers and leaders. And then I'm also going to share with you, and this is where we're going to have a load of fun. I'm going to share with you uh, some simple, uh, accessible uh, improv techniques that you can use that foster teamwork, collaboration, adaptability, creativity. And we're going to we're going to play some of them here today. So make sure you're ready to go. Um, but I also want to uh, help you see how easily you could replicate these this afternoon if you wanted to back with your teams. So um, I'm excited. Let's get started, shall we? Now, some of you may be somewhat familiar with uh, the world of improv because maybe you have watched or heard of the, uh, the the wonderful TV show, Whose Line Is It Anyway? And if you've never heard of Whose Line Is It Anyway, after today's session, uh, you can do a bit of Googling uh, and, and watch a couple of the clips. In fact, I almost, you can do that, right? Tell your boss that I said that you're allowed to Google Whose Line Is It Anyway and, <laughs> and watch some of this stuff. The, the way this kind of works is that uh, it's, this is improv theatre and, and improv theatre is all about where you get some performers up onto a stage and what they do, they, they'll get some suggestions from the audience and based on those suggestions from the audience, the performers engage in some collaborative storytelling. They'll tell a bit of a story, uh, they'll, they'll have a bit of a narrative arc depending upon the suggestions and nudges and interaction that they have with the audience. And it's um, they make it up as they go along, right, essentially. And it's kind of funny because <laughs> there's no script and these things can go in lots of different directions. But here's the thing, right, and if you've ever watched an episode of Whose Line Is It Anyway or any of those sort of improv shows, you'll know that just because they don't have a script and just because they don't know what's coming along, it doesn't mean that they're not prepared. And I think this is one of the big misnomers about improv is that it is about making it up without a script and kind of winging it. And whilst on the face of it, it looks like that, these performers, and if you've watched it, you know just how gifted they are and how much work must go in to delivering an outstanding improv performance. And it's the same with improv as leaders. It's not about just winging it. But it is about being adaptable and flexible and dealing with what's happening in the moment. But it also requires some discipline and some preparation. Right? So most of us are familiar with, with improv maybe from, from that perspective. But if we go back even a little bit more further, um, back in the 1920s, and when I was sort of doing some research uh, for, for this topic, because it's something that, that I'm uh, exploring a lot in, in, in our, our programs at the moment, I was alerted to, uh, back in the 1920s, there was, um, uh, Neva Boyd was her name, and she founded something called the Recreational Training School. And at that particular point in time, what she was doing was using short games and, and activities to teach people social skills, problem solving skills, collaboration and, and confidence. And in essence, what she did at this particular uh, training school was put people into modes of play and through these modes of play and interaction, that's how they gained these very important life skills. And this was fundamental because it, it was it was almost, uh, imagine in the 1920s, this was a very different way of, of teaching people. Uh, back then, they probably still had canes in the, in the schoolyards and, and schools were very sort of regimented in, in how they do things. So this was a fundamental change, but it was one of the first times where it's documented of this interaction between play and real learning. And the sort of the next sort of development of, of improv as we know it uh, came from this gentleman here, and his name is, is Dudley Riggs. And Dudley Riggs is a, um, or was a, a circus performer, and he uh, he started something um, you can see here, the Brave New Workshop, and he he started this idea of what he called instant theatre. 
And instant theatre was essentially improvisation. But where he got the idea from this was as a circus performer, and maybe this doesn't say too much for how good a circus performer he was, um, but he used to get heckled a lot by the audience. Now, again, uh, maybe that says something about how good he was, but he used to get heckled a lot by the audience. But what he worked out was rather than responding back to the heckling, He'd just take the heckling and he'd run with it. <laughs> he'd use the heckling and bring it in as part of the story and part of the, uh, the, the, the act that he was doing. So rather than either ignoring the heckling or kind of riling against it, he used to just embrace it and run with it. He would use the heckling to move forward with his story and to progress his show. In other words, he was improvising. And this technique, like it seems a bit weird now, but this, this technique, he became well known for his ability to be able to incorporate this audience stuff into his act. So much so that he had other performers, both in, in, in not just circus, but in comedy and theatre, coming to get advice and seeking guidance for him, which led to him starting up this, uh, this, uh, this workshop um, and this school. So this has a this has a, a rich history born out of of theatre, but also in the space of of education. And increasingly, we're starting to see improv uh, being used in in leadership. And but it's not all about the the fun. Most of you say, well, I'm I'm not a circus performer, and we're not in theatre, and I'm not teaching kids. I, I kind of get that, right? And we're not talking about that today. In fact, what we are talking about is taking some of this history of improv and working out how we can, and I'm going to show you how we can use it in an applied way to enhance levels of performance, to be more adaptable, more agile, more creative and more flexible um, within our leadership approach and within our organisations. And there's already a lot of organisations out there who do it. In fact, there's an organisation over in the States, the uh, Allen Aldrin School, and they actually teach improv uh, to scientists and medical professionals. Um, because often and teaches them how to be better communicators using some of the skills and tools of improv. Because you imagine, you know, uh, some of those uh, those folks in those orbits, they're extraordinarily clever, gifted people, uh, but they can sometimes struggle to make these very difficult concepts <laughs> and technical concepts make sense to mere mortals like you and I. So they're taught how to use improv uh, to, to better connect, to become better listeners, to pick up on the nuances of the people that they're talking to and to be able to work with those people to explain sometimes very difficult and challenging topics back to those, those audience. You see, and that's what improv is all about. It is about being adaptable. It's about being flexible. What we see on stage and what we see in those moments is almost like a, uh, like, like continuous little plan, do, check, act cycles. You know, if you've ever... Uh, explore the space of continuous improvement, innovation, Kaizen, Lean, whatever it is, you'll be very familiar with the plan, do, check, act cycle, these little iterations and evolutions that occur. And what improv is about is, and what we see on stage when we watch some of these theatre improv sessions, is these little plan, do, check, act cycles. And I reckon right now that this is what leadership is about. It's what our development day today is about, isn't it? It's about it's, it's about improvising. It's about plan, do, check, act. It's about understanding or embracing the, uh, the changes and the volatility and the uncertainty that's around in our world and working out, right, what are we going to do to respond to this? And knowing that just because we responded in a certain way today doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to hold true tomorrow when the whole world changes again. So we're constantly evolving. And that's why I think there is this wonderful intersection between improv and leadership. And if I double down on that a little bit more, here's some contrast. And I, I put this table together as I was reflecting on maybe the world before COVID <laughs> or you know, the, 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 the recent history compared to what the world looks like now. And what you'll see here is some ideas on what I think the world kind of was or what leadership and management and business uh, was on the left-hand side compared to what it looks like today. And you'll see that that I, I think down the bottom there, uh, one of the terms that I've used there is that I think that once upon a time, um, the world was mostly predictable. Yeah, there were some industry sectors that were a little bit more unstable and there were times of, of, of volatility. But for a long period of time, we have enjoyed a, a, a highly, in relative terms, somewhat stable, predictable world. Whereas I think what we're seeing now is that the world is mostly improvised. We have to make it up as, as we go. It doesn't mean that we are unprepared and it doesn't mean that it doesn't take any discipline, but we have to be ready to respond 
uh, very quickly to an ever-changing environment. And that's what improvisation is all about. Right? We need to take on board what we're faced with and work out how to adjust quickly. So let's have a look at six principles uh, for developing an improv mindset. So these principles, uh, again, developed through some research and, and uh, looking at um, the way improv is taught and some of the disciplines that we see of those improv professionals up on stage. And of course, improvisation at the essence is about that collaborative storytelling, right? It's, it's that in the moment storytelling. And when you when we see these 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 performers on stage, the reason that they're able to do it so effectively is because that they're prepared and they're following a set of what I don't know it might even be unwritten rules if you like or shared mindsets that allow them to collaborate and operate in an environment of psychological safety. Right? They can engage in the situation in the process and take safe risks. And we can only have that type of, of outcome if we have those preconditions, right? I need to feel safe and I need to feel comfortable and supported in taking risk. And, and that leads us to six principles that are critically important. And I think what you'll find as I'm going through these principles is that they're not just important from an improv mindset, but they're also just elements of, of highly effective team cultures. And I'll come back to that when I go through the principles. So let's start with the first one, trust. Right, you've got to trust yourself and you've got to trust your team. Right? In improv, you've got to trust yourself and you've got to trust your partner. You've got to trust that you've got to be able to trust that they've got your back and they need to be able to trust that you have their back. Right? So you need to demonstrate that you're trustworthy. You need to be able to show that um, that 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 you trust yourself. In other words, you need to be able to back yourself. You need to be able to get outside of your comfort zone and trust in yourself that you will be okay because of the skills and the knowledge and the perspective that you bring. But you also need to trust in yourself that you've got the relationship with your partner so that you can trust them as well. So trust, really important in improv. It's also about awareness, right? You need to be able to tune in to what's happening around you. So one of the things that we often talk about uh, in our leadership programs, our, our essentials, our foundations, and our accelerate is the importance of emotional intelligence. And one of the key aspects of any model of emotional intelligence that you look at is the importance of, of awareness. Awareness of self and awareness of others and situational awareness. And this is one of the things, you, as, as to, to engage in improv, we need to understand what's happening around us so that we can work out how to respond and we work out what the right magnitude of the response needs to be. You know, do I need to lean in a little or do I need to lean out a little? Is it my time to go or is it my time to stand back and allow others to shine? And based on what's just happened or what's changed, okay, now what do I need to do? What might I need to do? But it's also awareness to know about when you've, if you've leaned in and you probably should lean out, it's awareness enough to know that, okay, I need to adjust here. So there is awareness and that intersects strongly with uh, emotional intelligent leadership. The third one is all about acceptance, right? And it's about saying yes to your circumstances. Because let's face it, folks, there's a lot going on right now that is challenging for many of us. Um, in some cases, and I've heard many leaders say this, and I don't, necessarily disagree with, but they say, this is not fair. It should not be like this. It's not right that it's like this. Yes, <laughs> that's correct. But in improv, we say yes to our circumstances. It's not fair. And yes, it has happened. And now what? Right. So in improv, that's what we want to be able to do. It's like, you know, someone said something to you or your partner's done something or there's been a change in the pattern and the rhythm of what's going on. So we simply say yes to that and then ask ourselves, what next? It doesn't mean that we, 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 have, we might disagree with it. There might be a level of, of, of jar about it or an uncomfortability about it. Comfortability, is that even a word? I don't know. Uncomfortableness? I don't know. <laughs> it might not feel right, but we say yes to it anyway and ask ourselves what we can do next. Right. 
And then there's also movement, which links in with this, right? So it's like there's that acceptance of yes, and then there's the movement to say yes and, because it's the and piece that allows us to move forward. So yes, this has happened to us, and now what? What's our next move? What's the next thing that we're gonna do? Right? So it's yes and, acceptance and movement. And when you watch improv, that's what it's all about, right? I might be uncomfortable, I might be nervous about the suggestion that the audience has given me or the prop that I've been given, or I might be a little bit nervous or worried or off put by something that my partner said, but I accept it and I say yes and I move forward. And then the sixth one is all about empowerment. It's about, so the fifth one, sorry, is all about, I was gonna say there's one more. Uh, it's, it's about empowerment. It's about feeling free to explore ideas and take risk and empowering those around you to explore and take risks, right? So you need to feel empowered. You need to say, you know what? I feel comfortable to be able to take this idea and run with it. I need to feel free to put this out here and see what happens. And I wanna develop that within my team and those around me as well. And then the final one is commitment, right? Commitment, it's about staying fully engaged and all in. So in improv theatre, that's what we see. We see the absolute commitment of the performers on stage. They stay fully engaged and all in for the whole sort of section of, the, of that, that piece. You can't be half in or half out. They're absolutely there. They're present, they're aware, they're committed, they're empowered, they're demonstrating trust the whole time. Right? You don't stop until the director says stop and you play full out until that point in time. So what we see here, if I just sort of go back through these, I think you'd agree that these types of characteristics, uh, when we think about effective, high performing, even agile teams, these are some of the characteristics that we see. We see elements of trust. We see elements of awareness and high emotional intelligence. Hopefully we see a level of acceptance of our circumstances or willingness just to, to, um, uh, to, to, to yeah, well, acceptance is the right word. <laughs> I'm still gonna find another word, but it is. It doesn't mean that we might not, there might be a level of, 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 of unhappiness or dissatisfaction, but there's also a level of, of acceptance, but also the level of, of trust in ourselves to be able to move forward. And empowerment and commitment. So I guess what I'm saying to you today, folks, is that these mindsets, right, these, these underpinning principles of what great improv is all about is not that far from removed from what we might be trying to develop in a high performing team anyway. And chances are, maybe your team already has some of these mindsets, if not all of these mindsets at play. Maybe these are the principles and values that you're already working with. So this is, this is fascinating for me because what it means is that we don't have to move too far in terms of what we're already trying to build and develop as our teams to get them into a place where they're ready to engage in some of the, the tools and activities I'm about to prepare for you. Or maybe you look at some of these and go, okay, yeah, I've got a little bit of work to do with some of these elements within my team and that's okay as well. Right? So it's worth just reflecting on those six areas there. Where are you strong? Where, where have you got some work to do? Um, where is your team ready to go? and where might there be a little bit more development to play. So we can take these principles, and if we get this right, we can start to engage in some improv exercises. And what I wanna do now is give you some tools that you can use today, like, you, like literally today, we're gonna to play with them. And you might, you could use these things that I'm about to share with you this afternoon with your team if you wanted to. Like really, <laughs> all right? Now, I also want you to understand that the stuff that I'm gonna share with you, it is just food for thought, right? It's food for thought. And I wanna give you some stuff to think about, right? Some stuff to try. Now, I'm very conscious of the fact that some of the stuff that I'm gonna share with you will be really helpful. And some of the stuff I'm about to share with you go, eh, not really for me. And what I'd ask you to do is if I am sharing something with you or showing something, you're like, ah, oh, look, this is not really for me. That's okay, right? But use it for food for thought anyway. Say yes and, right? Yes, that's not really for me. And <laughs> what next for you, right? Don't just dismiss some of this stuff of out of hand because otherwise we're completely out of whack with what the improv mindset is, right? So I want you just to embrace it, take it on us for some food for thought. If it is for you, great. And if it's not, 
at least acknowledge that it's something to think about and something that you might try. And I'll deal with some of the barriers that often happen with this stuff to, to later on as well. So let's get into it. Let's uh, let me share with you the first little activity. So we call this one uh, Shakedown. So here's what I want you to do. I want everyone, now your cameras are off. No one can see you. So you are very, very safe right? You are very, very safe. Um, but what I would like everyone to do is to stand up for me. All right, I'm going to just move my chair out the way here. I want you to uh, stand up for me. Uh, like I say, no one can see you, so you're safe. So you put, put, just need to stop doing some of those emails for a minute, you know, stop uh, doing those uh, end of financial year reports. Just put that to one side uh, and uh, stand up in, in front of your desk, right? And just play along with me. Now I use this, some of you might say, what's what's about to go on here? And I want you to know that this technique, I, I, I've been playing with the, this stuff over the last few weeks and I did this uh, last week with a group of senior leaders in a finance organisation, right? A finance organisation. And I did this activity in the room with them. <laughs> right? So their cameras were absolutely on. Um, and so I just want you to, to play along. So we call this Shakedown and it's a really good energizer that you can use uh, with your team. Um, particularly if you're, you're working virtually and you're sitting down for a long period of time or you're engaged in a long meeting or your team's coming from one meeting into another meeting and you're looking for something just to energize people, this works really well. But it also intrinsically links to, to improv and I'll talk a little bit about it at the end. So it's called Shakedown and here's how it works. What we do is we count down from eight, so eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. And what we do is we do it with our right hand, then we do it with our left hand, we do it with our right foot, and we do it with our left foot, and we repeat, keep going, but the next time around we start with seven, and then we start with six, and each time we get faster and faster, and we get louder and louder, right? So we're going to do it. I'd love you to do it as well. You won't get, like I say, no one can see you. Hopefully, you, you, maybe you're in an office. And even if you are in an office with other people, do it anyway. It's going to be a load of fun, right? So I want you to, 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 to stand up with me, get ready to go, right? And I'm going to lead the way. And you can, I want you to say it out loud. I want you to do this with me, right? You ready? Eight seven six five four three two one eight seven six five four three two one eight seven six five four three two one eight seven six five four three two one. Seven six five four three two one 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 two one two one two one two one 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 Oh. Ah. Hi, I'll get my chair back. I need a seat. Right out. <laughs> All right. Into the chat box. How you feeling? How you feeling apart from exhausted? Right? How you feeling? Are you laughing? Are you smiling? Hopefully you didn't collapse on the floor. Right? But hopefully you've had a bit of fun there. Right? Hopefully you're feeling more energized. Hopefully you're feeling engaged, you're feeling less lethargic than you were before. Yeah. I'm exhausted. <laughs> um, uh, so this is really cool, right? Because what it does is it gets people's, it, get, it sets up the agenda that lets people know that we want high energy. We want people to move. We want people to bring energy to the conversation that we're about to have. It also signals to the group that I want your attention. Because even if you were checking the emails <laughs> while I was doing that stuff, chances are that I got your attention. It shifts the energy in the room and it gets people to focus. It's a really great little energizer linked with improv. It sets the agenda, makes it safe, gets everyone laughing, everyone moving and focuses the energy. <laughs> uh, good stuff, well done. And if you didn't try, that's all right. You can do it a little bit later on. So that's the first technique. Let me share with you another technique. And we call this one, yes and. and uh, again, if you watch Improv Theatre, you would have uh, seen this uh, quite a few times. And I'm gonna get uh, Sam Bell, he's gonna play along with me in a moment and we're gonna give this a crack. So here's how this works. In business at the moment, we're faced with a lot of wicked problems, a lot of challenges and, 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 and difficult things that we have to overcome. 
you know, many of the, the conversations that, that folks are having at the moment, of course, is, is about the labour market and the difficulty in uh, retaining people and the difficulty in attracting people. There's a lot of movement. Uh, there's a lot of people moving, not just from industry to industry. There's people staying in the same industry, moving around different organisations. And of course, there's just a, there's a skill shortage. There's a massive issue for many organisations at the moment. And that's just one example. That's what we call a, a, that's a wicked problem, right? It doesn't have a nice, neat, logical solution. We can't just go out and you know, shake some more skilled people out of the trees. And that's just one example, right? I'm sure that you've all got your own examples of what some of these wicked problems might look like. Now, often what happens, of course, is that when we're faced with these wicked problems, they have polarities, right? So that's the definition of a wicked problem, where there's these two things that kind of, or, you know, at least two, maybe more, two things that kind of exist that we think that we can't do both. They're just, they're, they're polar opposite, right? And the wicked question is about where we ask ourselves how we can do this thing and this thing at the same time. Rather than thinking that we can only have one or the other, how do we do both, right? So for example, you know, right now, you know, the, the, the question that many people are saying was how can we you know, achieve our strategic goals or our financial goals, whatever it might be, when we don't have enough people, right? We can either, we can either um, you know, pay over the odds to get more people in, but that will have an impact on our financial performance, or we can adjust our financial goals to meet the resources that we have available for ourselves. Now, the wicked question that underpins that, or a wicked question that we might ask ourselves here is, well, how can we deliver great outcomes and only use the resources that we've got? Now, of course, what can happen is if you ask that question in, in a leadership or a team meeting or a version thereof, of course, what will happen is you'll get to that, ah, oh, that can't happen, can't possibly do that, right? That's impossible, right? Or that's going to be far too difficult for us to do. And it leads to that negative spiral. Now, remember that one of the mindsets of, of, of improv is all about movement and acceptance. So what this means is that we say, okay, well, let's accept the reality. Let's accept the reality that these are the goals and aspirations and stuff that we have to do as, as leaders. These are the results that we have to try and achieve. And the other reality is that we don't have the resources in terms of people, whether it's in numbers or, or, or skill or whatever it might be, that we would like to have access to. So how do we accept that and move forward? How do we accept that and have the next conversation rather than it can't happen? So the improv approach towards this is using this little activity of called yes and. Yes and. So Sam is gonna help me. So Sam, if I could get you to uh, jump in, uh, take yourself off mute, that'd be great. Um, Thank so you, you can do I'm this activity. Um, <laughs> you're feeling nervous, that's okay. A little bit nervous. <laughs> you're in I, safe hands. I did love some of the comments that came through on your first improv. Uh, I think um, um, someone said everyone else on the floor thinks I'm crazy. So uh, <laughs> very good. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Right. So you can do this next activity. You can do this online. You can do this face to face. So Sam, here's what's going to happen. Right. We're, we're, you and I, we're going to have a party, and we're going. Right. We're going. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. We're having a party. Get excited. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Sam, we're going to yeah. have a party, and uh, we're going to decide in advance what we're going to bring. But instead of yes and, what we're going to do is we're going to do this a little bit differently. And we're going to do what normally happens when teams and leaders are faced with wicked problems, which is no, but we can't. <laughs> My idea is better than your idea. So that because normally that's what happens in these types of meetings. We all know how it goes, right? So in the end, up, what happens when we're in that moment? We end up being like energy sucking, soul destroying jerks. So we're going to have a go at being energy sucking, soul destroying jerks for the next little while. Um, we don't mean to be, neither of us, we're good blokes, right? We don't mean to be that. But in these types of contexts when we're competing with ideas and, and, and using the word no, but that's what happens. So here's what's going to happen. I'm going to start off and, oops, I'll just get this up. Here we go. I'm going to, uh, and this is how this works, I'm going to say what I'm going to bring to the party, right? And then Sam, I want you to respond and say, no, but I'm going to bring. And then I'm going to take a turn and then you will take a turn. So for example, um, um, I'll say, start off and you'll just counter with, no, but I'm going to bring this. You ready? Yep. So Sam, we're having a party, yay! 
Yay, that's it. And Samuel, <laughs> I'm excited. I am going to bring some chips. No, but I'm going to bring some balloons. Oh, no, I'm going to bring lemonade. No, I'm going to bring beer. Oh, no, I'm going to bring scotch. No, I'm going to bring an esky. No, I'm going to bring a swimming pool. No, I'm going to bring a truck. No, I'm going to bring a Mr. Whippy van. Not sure I can beat that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Can you see what happens here? This doesn't work. Can you see what happened there, Sam? Did you notice that even though it wasn't our intention, we started competing? Yeah. yeah. Right? We started competing. It became a game of one-upmanship, right? And this is what happens when we use the word no but. And it doesn't have to be no but, right? We kind of, it's yuck, right? We get to this point where it's, the conversation's closed. It's pretty awful. We're going around in circles. No one is really listening to anyone else. It's like, wah, wah, wah. It, it doesn't work. We need to do better. So I want to contrast that with yes and. So Sam, we're going to do this again, but this time I want you to say yes and I'm going to bring, right? Let's see what we can do. Right, so we're having a party, Sam, and I am going to bring some streamers. Yes, and I'm going to bring some balloons. Yes, and I'm going to bring some corn chips. Yes, and I'm going to bring some friends. <laughs> uh, yes, and I'm going to bring some party hats. Yes, and I'm going to bring some streamers. <laughs> oh, we've already got some. We'll have lots of streamers. Yes, and I'm going to bring some confetti. And we'll go on, right? Can yeah. we see? Can you feel energetically how different this is? And we're just having a bit of fun here. But energetically, and I'm sure everyone will have noticed it. And Sam and I, Sam, we haven't rehearsed this at all, have we? <laughs> Sam had no idea what was going to happen, right? But here's, this is what happens. This is the energetically, it's different. And we're building on each other's ideas, right? So this is, this is the essence of, of yes and. And the reason that is, thank you, Sam. I'm going to draw you back in in a minute. We're going to have another little competition, but a little, a little uh, uh, activity. But if you want to um, uh, catch your breath for a moment, you can. Thank you, Sam. Let's all give Sam a, a virtual round of applause. <laughs> right? Here's what I like about, you can do a simple activity like that. You can insert anything. The party is just one. But here's what happens when you do it. People become hyper aware in, a, in the meeting or the conversation that you're having. People become hyper aware of the no buts. You know, so if you're trying to have a conversation dealing with a problem or a challenge, and we, there's always those people who say, oh, yeah, nah, but that won't work. When you do a, an improv activity like that, people become hyper attentive to those no little buts, right? And there's less likelihood that those things will interrupt the flow of your meeting, right? It also helps people to seek out or helps you as a leader to seek out opportunities to honour and validate the contribution of others. Because yes and means that I'm building upon the ideas of other people. So when we use this in a meeting, someone shares an idea or perspective, an opinion, and we say yes and. It demonstrates that, that we validate and we hear their idea and we want to build upon it, right? Now, it doesn't have to be yes and, of course. You can use words like thank you or I hear you, or I love that, and something else we might want to consider is, these things move the conversation forward. Yes, and, really, and I've, again, I've been playing with this over the last couple of weeks, and I promise you, it absolutely works. People listen more intentively, they, even they sense that when they have the energy, to be, or have the urge to be those kind of energy sucking, soul destroying jerks and say no but. And I don't know, even I've done it. I've been in meetings where I feel like wanting to say no but. <laughs> and it's like, oh, actually, that's going to go down like a lead balloon uh, in this context. Right? So I promise you, if you, you play with this, uh, there can be some, some pretty good results. And you can use it immediately. You don't need anything else to, other than that to go and try this this afternoon. Gives people permission to contribute. It able to add the conversation without competing or shutting others down and helps people to freely share their ideas. Yep. So that's tool number one. Let me share another one with you. This one is called should have said. Now this is, uh, this is a pretty good uh, concept as well. 
uh, straight from improv theatre. Uh, and th what happens in improv theatre with this game is that the performers are on stage and they're telling a story, right? They're telling a story. And at any point in the story, the audience can yell out, or the director can yell out, should have said, right? And whenever that comment comes up, the performers have to restate what they just said, but changing the way they said it, maybe adding some clarity, maybe adding some new thinking, changing the way that they said it. So in other words, I've got to rephrase what I just said, right? So imagine, hi, I'm Shannon Cooper. I'm a facilitator and coach with the Institute of Managers and Leaders. Should have said, hi, I'm Shannon Cooper. I work with Australia's oldest and leading organisation uh, that supports managers and leaders. Should have said, Hi, I'm Shannon Cooper, um, and my wife can't explain exactly what I do for work. <laughs> I don't know, right? So <laughs> this is a really cool technique um, that you can use, again, to have a little bit of fun, but where it really comes to its fore is through problem statement development. So when you're trying to understand a problem or you're trying to articulate a problem, sometimes, and I'm sure we've all been in these situations, sometimes you go, I don't understand what that person said. You know, they use the term provider. What does that mean? Or they use the term stakeholder or, you know, synchronicity. I don't, what, what? I don't understand what they mean. Now, typically in those moments, we just sit there and we go, oh, I don't know. Hopefully it'll make sense to me soon, right? But there's something weird about saying to someone, sorry, I don't understand what you're talking about. Or what do you mean by that? I don't know. We, we, there's a level of discomfort that often comes with that. So this makes it safe because if we, we introduce the activity, what we can do is when someone says provider, stakeholder, <laughs> synchronicity, design thinking, innovation, and we don't know exactly what they mean, we can simply say, should have said, right? And they will force them to restate what they said. So it's really useful, again, when there's lots of jargon, giving people the freedom to say, should have said, Right? When collaborating with others who might speak a different language, either because of the technical aspect or even culturally, it allows for that safe clarification. And it takes the blame out of saying, yeah, what do you mean? Or I don't understand. You know, I was with a team um, a couple of weeks ago, again, been experimenting with all these activities. I was with a team a couple of weeks ago, and uh, they're involved in industrial equipment. And one of the, 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 the folks was explaining something that had happened. And there was someone else in, who, who didn't really understand it. And they didn't speak up in the moment. But we came back from one of the breaks. And this person said to the group, oh, do you mind if we just go back to that example that you said earlier? And you mentioned this. Can we just should have said that? <laughs> and the person said, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. What I meant was, mm. and I thought, wow. That's really cool, right? It made it safe for that person. So this person clearly didn't understand it in the moment. They didn't speak up in the moment, but that's okay. But they at least had a safe way to go back to that person and say, hey, I didn't get what you said. Can you explain it again? So should have said, you can have some fun with it, but this, I, I love this and I've noticed that uh, um, it leads to much better, uh, it gets rid of groupthink. You know, groupthink when everyone locks in an idea and sometimes we lock in an idea because we don't all understand it. So this is a really great tool that can get rid of that and, and aid deeper understanding, but also help people articulate their thoughts and ideas in a way that's more broadly understood. So should have said, we're not gonna practice with that one, but we are gonna practice with this one. So I'm gonna bring Sam back in now and we're gonna do uh, something called a one word story. And this is pretty simple. The way that this works is that Sam and I are going to tell a story one word at a time. <laughs> One word at a time. And the story that Sam and I are going to tell today is Little Red Riding Hood. Now, I reckon most of you are familiar with the story of Little Red Riding Hood, you know, the, the young girl who goes out in, into the bush with some baked goods to, to her grandmother who's sick. And along the way, she's, um, you know, she meets a few people and she gets to the house. And before she can get to the house, there's a big bad wolf who comes and gets the grandma and then dresses up in the... We, we know the story. So, Sam, you and I are going to tell this story one word at a time. You ready? I'm going to start. Once. Yes. Upon. A. Time. There. Was. A. Little. Girl. Named. <laughs> who? Is it who? Little. Little.
Little. Red. Riding. <laughs> Good. Who? Went. To. Her. Local. Shop. To. Purchase. Half six. Eggs. Two. Cook. Some. Omelets. <laughs> now, some people are going, this is not the Red Riding Hood I remember, Sam. What were you doing? <laughs> what were we doing? <laughs> oh, I was trying to remember the story. So, it's been a while. <laughs> so here's why I love this, right? This, this, this is, thank you, Sam, uh, for playing. Hey, thank what you, was Shannon. that like for you? What was that like for you? For me, for me, yeah, uh, fun. I thought it was. A, fun. I thought it was good fun. Yeah, it's fun. Was it, was it's a, collaborative. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and 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 I felt a connection, Shannon. I'm not sure where the story was going, but it was a. But it was good. Yes. See, here's the. This is what I love. Thank you, and it encourages listening as well, right? It it it, it is. And again, it might have been a bit tedious for you, but here's what happens. This is a really good activity that says, look, we all know, you know, if Sam and I had continued on with that, we all know how the Little Red Riding Hood story ends up. But somehow we ended in a shop buying eggs to make an omelette. <laughs> like you kind of go, what? What happens there? Right? And this is really cool because it shows everyone that that we can practice working. I think it's the second dot point here. As a team, we can practice, helps us get understand that we can be working towards a goal, even though we don't know how we're going to get there. And we might go off on many different tangents, but if we back ourselves and trust ourselves, establish some of those other mindsets of improv that we'll get there, and that everyone's contribution is, is valuable, and everyone's contribution is part of the solution. See, without Sam, I was nothing there. And without me, Sam was nothing there. But it also creates an element of surprise in getting to the goal via an unexpected path. Because at the moment, there's a lot of that going on. We've got a lot of goals and we have to explore some unexpected paths. So this creates a level of, of comfort or a nice little metaphor and anchor point for helping people understand that that's what happens. It also busts out some hierarchy with all participants being equal, right? Because it didn't matter whether I was, you know, what the relationship between Sam and I is, we were both equal parts of that story. And no contribution is too small. Even if the only word I used was A, I don't even know if that's a word, right? But if, if when I offered, you know, once upon a time, even that contribution, it was small, but it still had a role to play. So this is a great activity that can teach us that, look, sometimes things will meander along. Some contributions will be significant. Sometimes we'll go in a few different angles. But there is always, uh, it, it all plays a part in helping us develop and collaborate, build relationships and move towards a goal. Right? So you could do that with your team this afternoon as well. Pick any story. It doesn't have to be Red Riding Hood. <laughs> Pick any story that you like. Um, as an aside, as I've been practicing and, and, and playing with some of these activities uh, in the lead up for today, um, this is now my eight-year-old's favorite game. Dad, can we do the one word story? Yeah, yeah, sure. But she has all these books that I don't remember. <laughs> like, she's eight years old. The books that they read these days, I don't remember. You know, Harry McClary's Dairy and all these other. If you've got kids, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But kids love this as well. It's it's great fun. Right. Uh, um, Shannon, Shannon really just out. quickly, just yeah. before, just, I'm sorry to interrupt. You, I think your camera's gone off. Um, it is for, oh. for myself here. I'm not sure if others are seeing that, but. Huh. That's weird. All right, I will, I will keep trucking on and then I'll yeah, um, see yeah. what we can do to <laughs> actually. That, so let me see if I just flip this over. Maybe it got a bit weird because this next activity, I need my camera. See if that works, see if that comes back on. Does that come back on, Sam? No, it has. Oh, yeah, there it is. Yes, you're on. Yep. Ah, oh, perfect. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Don't know what happened there. Apologies for that. Um, right. So this one is called Reflection and Mirror. 
So this one, again, pretty much as it sounds. And the way that you would do this is you pair people up, right? So you get people together, whether it's in a breakout room, if it's virtual or face-to-face, -face, we pair people up. If you want to do a trio, that's okay as well. One of the things though is important about this activity is that when you pair people up, probably don't have direct reports with their managers. <laughs> um, and for the reason is that we want to avoid that kind of hierarchy stuff, right? Um, and the way it works is that you face each other and you follow the movement that the other person makes, right? So Sam, um, I hope for my camera's on. If I can get you to come back again. Sam uh, didn't know how to work so hard today. Righto, we Sam. Go. So what we're gonna do, really simple, is I am going to do some moves and I want you to just follow my moves. Right, okay. you ready? Okay. Yeah. Now you can't see, can you? <laughs> Head up. <laughs> I'm sitting down, Shannon. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now we're going to switch. Righto, Sam, your go. I'm going to follow you. Okay. <laughs> All right, we'll stop there. All right. So um, now generally when I do that activity, thank you, Sam, again. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you. Awesome. That's the last time. I, that's the last little game, Sam. But look, here's here's what about this and how does this work? So you do it for a minute, and the reality is it feels like 20 minutes. And if you were watching Sam and I going, oh, this is kind of tedious. <laughs> you sort of watch it when you're watching. It's like, oh, it's only a minute, but it seems like a lot longer. But what it does is it um, it 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 does a couple of things. It reminds people of, <laughs> I had someone say the other day that um, you know payback is not fun and if you do something hard to the person, they're gonna do something hard back at you. But it highlights the responsibilities of leaders and followers, right? It reminds us that our behavior matters and that the energy that we bring to the room will often be reciprocated by those folks that we're working with. In other words, if you come into the room particularly if you are in a leadership role, you come into a room and your energy is, you know, and your demeanor and your attitude is, that's what will happen. The rest of the mood of the meeting and the, and the demeanor of the people around you will also be. On the flip side, if you enter with a level of energy and excitement or optimism or just, you know, a, a confidence, then that will be matched and mirrored. Because we're human, we follow people. Mentioned my daughter, eight, my eight-year-old daughter. I remember uh, one of the very first times, and we've all had these experiences, haven't we? When uh, when our our kids are, are little little babies, or if you've got nieces, nephews, family members, whatever it might be, you go up to a little baby, and of course we we end up pulling faces. And I never forget the very first time I'm staring down at my um, my my daughter, my half uh, Peyton. My daughter, my wife was was cradling her, and I sort of looked at Peyton, and I sort of went Meh, like that with my tongue. And of course, what does she do? <laughs> with their tongue. <laughs> it's like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> right? The influence that we have as leaders is kind of like that, right? As humans, we match and mirror what we think is, is, is expected and what we think is required. And the reflection and mirror reminds us of that. And it gets people to reflect on the energy that they're bringing into the room, right? Who are we? What are we bringing to the conversation? How do you want to be perceived today, right? Because that matching mirroring reminds us of this stuff. So that's another little improv activity that you can do. So here you go, you've got some tools that you can play with, right? I've given you some tools, some things that again, a load of fun, the people in the office might think you're crazy, but that is absolutely okay. But I go back to what I said at the start is that these little games and activities, whilst we might think that they're games and activities, really can help us as leaders. And I hope I've been able to illustrate that, that, that they have a level, of, um, a, a level of, of, of real practice and real application for us as leaders. Because I think you'll also see, if I go back to this contrast chart that I had, is that we see that all these things that I've shared with you today, in addition to teamwork, collaboration, agility, psychological safety, adaptability, promotes all of these things on the right-hand side of this contrast chart. In other words, I think that this is a, a perfect approach, skill set, 
tools, uh, toolkit that an, a, a leader needs right now. So you got your starter kit, we got shakedown, we got yes end, you got your one word stories, you got your should have said, you got your reflection and mirror. Just start practicing these. Right now, some you, know, you might be sitting here, and I get this right. Some like, oh, look, my people wouldn't be doing. Oh, people won't do this, Shannon. Or, oh, yeah, I don't want anything to do with any of this stuff. Um, well, maybe, but here's what I know based on my research and my experience over the last couple of weeks. This has got nothing to do with personalities. This has got nothing to do with with who your people are or who you are. This is just human stuff, and it's good fun. And hopefully today, as you've seen Sam and I interact. You've seen that it is good fun, but it also has uh, some real grounding and some real application. So please don't go away and assume that, ah, oh, my, this is a tough group, they won't like this. Or I had someone say, oh, look, our people are really smart, they won't like, it's like, oh, okay, what, so you're suggesting this only works with dumb people? <laughs> it's like, it's weird, right? Oh, I don't think my team will think that this is very professional. <laughs> it's like, professional, what? What's not professional about this? It can be professional, right? Well, what about this one? I said to Sam, I'm not, you're not gonna act like a chicken, are you? <laughs> it's not about that. It's not about that. So just don't assume this stuff. Trust yourself and trust your team, right? But that doesn't mean that we wanna surprise people, right? Or we wanna make people feel unsafe. So maybe don't say we're gonna do some improv. Say, we're gonna do some collaborative activities, or we're gonna do a teamwork activity, or I wanna demonstrate something to you that's important for us as we communicate and try and problem solve today. Maybe don't use the term improv, because the reality is that I know that we've got you know 150 odd people on today's session, and I know that there'll be a portion of people who have come to other parts of our development day today and aren't here now. And the reason that they aren't here now is because they saw the title of it and they thought, oh, that's not for me. That's not for me, that improv, that's a bit kitschy, that's a bit naff, that's not for me. So sometimes even the word improv can be a little bit of a barrier for people. But do it anyway, test and learn, test and learn. Give it a go with your team, try some of these things and just see what happens. And like I always say, one of the, the things I often talk about in my innovation workshops is adopt, adapt, abandon. You know, So adopt it, give it a go, adapt it, make it work for your team and your context and your personal leadership style. And if it works, great. And if it doesn't, abandon it, try something else. But continue to practice, practice, practice. And the thing that I always say, and I'm gonna ask you folks, at the end of each one, just ask people, what do you experience today? What was your experience and what feels safe to try now? Right? So here's my final question for you before we open up for any Q&A, if we've got some time left. And I'd love you to type into the chat box, what did you experience today? Over the last hour and the last uh, development day session um, today with Sam and I, what was your experience? And if you tried some of the activities, what was your experience? And for you, what feels safe for you to try? And I'd love you to type into the chat box uh, your reflections on that. So finally, uh, Sam, we might open up. We've got any time for any questions. We've got our upcoming uh, workshop on the screen there, but uh, Sam, I'll hand back over to you and uh, we'll see some comments and maybe some questions coming in. And thanks so much for playing today, Sam. Round of applause. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you very much. I didn't come to work today thinking I'll be doing improv in front of a couple of hundred people, but um, <laughs> certainly um, it was it was a lot of fun. Uh, my experience of it was it was it was really good fun and and actually. Um, yeah, it brings out a bit of humour and 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 also also great thinking and connection as well. So, um, but there's a lot of um, there's a lot of comments coming through here. There's a question that someone raised earlier that I might touch on because my my screen's going up and down with all these comments coming through. But um, someone asked, uh, what happens when you use this with highly competitive teams? Does it does it change at all when you use these sort of techniques with highly competitive teams in a highly competitive environment? Look, I, I think sometimes it does. Like it can be, um, some of these things can be naturally competitive, even like the yes and stuff can be highly competitive. Um, but I, I, my, my experience so far is that the it's healthy competition and it's useful competition. It's like it's like a football team where there's competition for spots. So where we're all competing, but we're doing it to try to lift the tide and the, the performance of the whole team. So I think that in those highly competitive environments, it does exist, but 
It's not, it's competing for the sake of lifting the whole team's level of performance, engagement and collaboration. Certainly that's been my experience so far. Thanks, Shannon. Um, just a comment here from Matt. I experienced a, a bit of laughs, some positive games and tools to add to my leadership belt. So there you go, Shannon. Ah, um, Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Donna's also said, I think she said at the outset, actually, um, that Whose Line Is It Anyway was her favourite show. So, um, ah, so she does very well. Um, thank you, Shannon. Excellent presentation. The no but session definitely resonated with me and reminded me of many interactions I've had in the past. Any tips on how you approach others who often start their responses with no, um, yeah. apart from introducing them um, to the <laughs> yes and activity? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, when you've got someone who says, oh, no, uh, I always listen to what they have to say and just get curious about it and, and, and ask them, you know, specifically, what do you mean by that? Uh, and then respond to their no with a yes and. Um, and that role models the behaviour. It, it honours what they've said if you, without introducing the improv. So it's, you know, someone says, oh, no, we can't do that. Okay, tell me more about that. Oh, okay, yeah, that could work. And what about? So what happens is that we start to role model that type of behaviour, but we also set the agenda for the conversation that we want to move this forward. And then sometimes I will double down on something that I call a broken record technique. And because you might say, well, then they'll respond back with another no and another no. But I promise you, if you keep responding with a yes, energetically, the yes is more appealing for most people, unless we're talking about the extremes of negative people. Most people energetically respond more favourably to a yes, right? Cognitively, our brain lights up with that, the no stuff, more of a negative, bit of flight and fight stuff in this. So I generally find that if you say yes and, yes and, yes and, about three times to a no person, they'll jump in sync with you. Great advice. Thank you so much, Shannon. There's a lot of comments and questions coming through. I know we're probably a couple of minutes past time. I, we, you and I may have gone a bit too long with our games there, but um, with our <laughs> improv, but um, it, was, it was a lot of fun. But no, thank you so much, Shannon. A really terrific presentation. I think it wraps today's development day so nicely. You know, I think all the, all the presentations today have been different. There's been a lot of diversity in the content and uh, it's wrapped it really nicely with, with finishing with some really practical activities people can take away. Um, so thank you so much, Shannon, for giving up your time. I know, you know, you're in between leadership programs for us. So you've, um, so you've, um, you've, um, you've done very, very well today. Um, uh, just quickly, that, uh, that workshop that Shannon had up uh, before, um, uh, Thinking Critically, uh, is coming up on the 19th of July. We do have a development day special there. So use that QR code. If you want to use that QR code, um, jump in that workshop, you know, will be fantastic. You've all seen Shannon before. His content, his delivery is exceptional. So that workshop, Thinking Critically, is one of our most popular, I know, at the Institute. So um, so please um, join that. Um, I'd also say our uh, end of financial year uh, pricing is still available on our, right across all our leadership programs. Please jump on the website, managersandleaders.com.au and please have a look at those. Um, and if you've got any questions at all, please email the institute info at managersandleaders.com.au. We're always here and happy to um, answer any questions you've got. Today's uh, session will be is recorded and all the resources and the recording will be emailed out to you very shortly. Uh, but once again, I want to thank you, Shannon, for your time. I, I also thank you. And I also want to thank um, a number of people here at the Institute. Um, this is our last session of Development Day um, for our second quarter. Um, so I want to thank um, Libby in particular, who's done an amazing job in the in the background, uh, making sure that I'm prepared, but also making sure we're here today. Um, I want to thank Libby. I want to thank um, Julie for a lot of the content work. Julie Langdon, who's instructional design um, for, for the Institute. I want to thank Scott Martin, Anna Pohl, um, and everyone involved across um, the team um, that has played a role in bringing this fantastic content and a really great topic and relevant topic for individuals and businesses that you know we're all going through change and we need to adapt and we need to learn new skills in how we adapt to situations. And I hope today has given you some fantastic professional development um, and some things to take away that you can now practice in your workplace. So look, on behalf of the Institute, um, thank you so much. Thank you to our members for joining. Thank you to our corporate clients as well. We know so many of you joined today as groups. Um, and that's why the improv sessions would have been absolutely hilarious in those groups, Shannon, because 
Brim would have been shaking their arms and legs around. Um, but um, look, thank you so much. We look forward to bringing you our next instalment of Development Day next quarter. Um, but for the time being, thank you so much. Thank you for the support of the Institute. We'll see you all soon.